My name is Russell Goldborn. I'm a professor of French literature here at King's and Dean of Arts and Humanities. And it gives me great pleasure to say a few words of welcome at the start of this um, really impressive event. This is, as you know, a collaboration between King's, uh, the Center for Hellenic Studies within our Department of Classics at King's, um, collaboration between King's and the University of uh, Chicago and the New School for Social Research in New York. So I want to thank all the colleagues who've been involved in organizing the event. So my particular thanks to my colleagues here at King's, Michael Squire and Roddy Beaton, but also thanks to Dietrich Boschung, who is here from Cologne, and Paul Kotman from, from New York. A fantastic range of speakers. I'm sorry that I'm only going to be, be able to stay for part of this morning. Um, from a, and a range of speakers from all kinds of disciplines. I think the, day, the, the, the days ahead look um, extremely exciting, and I hope you have a very um, productive and interesting time. It seems to me that this is the ideal place for us to be thinking about Hegel's aesthetics. Uh, if I remember my Hegel correctly, he finished his lectures on aesthetics in Berlin in 1829, the very year in which this institution was founded. Um, so there is, albeit a rather tenuous one, uh, a rather happy link there, I think. Um, so this seems to be the right subject in the right place. We're just around the corner, um, loosely speaking, um, from the British Museum as well, and I think there's going to be a tour on, on Saturday, is that on Friday, for, for some of the speakers. Um, I hope you get to see the figure of Ilissos there, one of the uh, Elgin marbles, of course, so admired by, by Hegel. The artist, he said, has softened the marble, animated it, and given it a soul. Um, I hope there will be animated and lively conversations over the next few days. Now, talking of beauty, um, and as a professor of French, I can't resist, finally, um, uh, referring to one of my favorite French writers, Gustave Flaubert. Um, whose correspondence I was, bit of whose correspondence I was reading last night. And it was striking that Hegel's appreciation of beauty served as a rather um, a useful antidote for Flaubert's appreciation um, of a slightly different kind of beauty. Flaubert in 1872, already in his 50s, was writing to uh, yet another of his young uh, women lovers, uh, a 30-something uh, widow, called Léonie Brenne, and he wrote as follows, you'll forgive me if I quote in French, firstly, je rêve à vos visites de cet hiver comme à une chose très ancienne et très douce. So these happy memories of her recent visit uh, during which they did uh, who knows what. Et je vais me remettre à lire du Hegel en tâchant de ne plus songer à cette chère belle figure que je voudrais couvrir de baisers. Um, so thoughts of Hegel will help him to uh, cope with being parted from his beloved mistress. Uh, a week later, he writes rather bluntly to his mistress to tell her that his, uh, his mother has just died. I'm not sure if Hegel helped him to, to deal with that situation as well. But there we go. I wish you very well for the next few days. I hope you have fruitful, lively, enjoyable conversations. Enjoy being at King's. Enjoy being in London. And my thanks again to everybody for, for being here. Thank you. Well, good morning, in turn. Um, my name is Roderick Beaton. I'm director of the Center for Hellenic Studies uh, here at King's. And I'd just like to uh, second and to follow the words of welcome from the dean um, to welcome all of you to King's uh, to the start of this marvelous three-day event. And I'd just like to take this opportunity to say uh, a, f a very few words about the Center for Hellenic Studies, and then I will hand over to the experts who really know what's going on for the next three days, and they will tell you what you really want to know. But the Center for Hellenic Studies at King's was founded in 1989, and we are within the Classics Department, but we're also part of the Arts and Humanities Research Institute here at King's. Um, and our role is to promote knowledge and understanding of Greek history, culture, and language of all periods. So it's the, the Hellenic world, or the Hellenic, is basically what brings us together in the Center for Hellenic Studies. And uh, we have a particular focus on, compar on, on comparison, cross-cultural, diachronic, um, emphasizing the fact that we have a classics department here that uh, focuses on all aspects of the Greek world from remote prehistory right down to the crisis that's plaguing Greece and Cyprus at this moment. 
But in the Centre for Hellenic Studies, we, we aim to, to reach out uh, both within the college and to other institutions in London and indeed abroad. We are, uh, we are very much an interdisciplinary group and a cross-departmental one. We are all about collaboration and partnership. One of the things that um, we, one of the goals we set ourselves is uh, to host and help to organize each year at least one academic conference. And in 2016, I'm happy to say that actually we've been involved in no fewer than three. And the centerpiece of these three is indeed this one on the art of Hegel's aesthetics. Um, last week, uh, our colleague Edith Hall convened a conference on classics and at stroke as world literature that was exploring the reception of ancient Greek literature across the, the, uh, across the, the literature of the entire globe. And that was a co-production between the Department of Classics, the Center for Hellenic Studies, and our Department of Comparative Literature here at King's. Next month, in a different partnership with, the with our own Department of Music this time, and with two cultural partners based in Athens, we will be putting on a hybrid event. Uh, this is the one that there's a poster about on, the, on your seats. Part conference, part workshop, uh, part, a uh, first for us, a concert. Um, with musicians coming from Athens on the title on the subject of sounds of the Hellenic world. And this will be exploring both the reception of ancient Greek music this time in the modern world, but also very specifically how uh, some of the cultural responses in the area of music that are going on in Greece in response to the crisis and also by Greeks in other places. So that's just a, a, a foretaste of the various kind of partnerships that uh, we very much cherish in the Center for Hellenic Studies. And I was particularly delighted when uh, my colleague Michael Squire came to me um, uh, just a, a little more than a year ago, um, ask, inquiring um, with quite undue, if I may say so, diffidence, would the center possibly be interested in hosting a conference on Hegel and aesthetics? And we talked about it, and I have to confess I'm rather ignorant of the subject. Um, I began to learn rather rapidly from uh, Michael, and the more I heard, and the more he told me about the partners with whom he was working in Cologne and in New York, the more exciting I thought this prospect was. So I'm very pleased indeed, not only that all of you are here, but that all of you and that Michael um, were, um, how can I put it, are, are, are willing to be hosted by uh, the Center for Hellenic Studies uh, here at King's. We're very pleased uh, to have you. So here we're going to be looking at yet another topic um, dear to our hearts in the center, again, one with huge diachronic reach, affecting the way, very fundamental ways in which the reception of aspects of ancient Greek culture has played a part right at the very beginning of modernity and all that's flowed from that, but here in the fields of philosophy, aesthetics, and art history. So in turn, I'm very pleased to welcome our partners, uh, our new partners, the Internationales Colleg Morphomata of the University of Cologne, and the New School for Social Research in New York. So um, I'd like now to call on Professor Dietrich Borschung from Cologne to take the floor, and he will be followed in turn by the organizers of the conference, Professor Kotman from New York, and our own uh, Michael Squire, um, who, let me add, uh, was, uh, has relatively recently been promoted to reader in classical art. Um, over to you, Professor Borschung. Morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dietrich Boschung. I'm one of two directors of the Internationales Kolleg Morphomata, or the International Center for the Humanities at the University of Cologne. I'm very honored to welcome you on behalf of the Morphomata Center, and I'm uh, happy to use this opportunity to introduce our institution in a few words. Morphomata is a center for advanced studies in the humanities at the University of Cologne, as I already said. I, it has been founded by the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research since 2009. The center invites up to 10 fellows uh, to Cologne every year to conduct their research here with us, together with us at Cologne for up to one year. 
It also organizes international conferences on a regular basis, and you can find an overview of our work we have done so far on our website indicated here, or some in the, in the leaflet you find in, in, your, um, in your bags. The name of Homata, as classicists know, is derived from the ancient word morphoma, morphoma meaning form as the result of the process of taking or giving shape. So the name draws attention to the fact that artifacts are not merely products of or storage for concepts and knowledge, but are also involved in decisively forming and altering them. The center investigates how concepts and knowledge take on concrete forms in, at, at, in artifacts, how they change in the process of their formation and how they in turn affect uh, contemporary or subsequent concepts. Morphomata is thus interested in the interplay between a consciousness which creates form and a material or a medium which gives shape, be it in a stone, in stone, in a text, in painting, or in a ritual, for example. This conference on Hegel's aesthetic perfectly complements our center's research interest because Hegel also tries to explain in what way the mind and the arts are interrelated. This is also one of our central questions in our theoretical approach. But then for me as an archeologist and not being a Hegel expert at all, I have to confess, so uh, I'm the wrong people for this conference. Uh, so, but for me as an archeologist, it is however striking how little um, Hegel engaged with concrete forms of Greek or Roman art. Only en passant does he mention statues like those here, like the Apollo and Belvedere, or a passing Venus, the Sauroctonos, or a faun with uh, the, light, the childlike Bacchus. He just mentioned them, but he never explains and he never describes something uh, like that. Nevertheless, for Hegel, Greek statues are the center of classical art, which plays, as everyone knows, a key role in his aesthetic system. Hegel mentions Winkelmann and criticizes him, criticize him for the Fahrt, for the Fahrtheit seines Ideals, maybe we, you can translate it for the blandness of, of his ideal, without, however, engaging with Winkelmann's ideas or arguments. The most distinguished archaeologist of the early 19th century, such as Ennio Quirino Visconti or Christian Gottlob Heine, are either unknown to Hegel or regarded as too insignificant to be mentioned. It is evident that Hegel develops his notion of Greek art for the most part from literary sources and that he did not make an effort to make his own observation. Uh, on antique statues themselves. For him, it is not the statues as such that are important, but what prominent thinkers like Lessing or Schelling had to say about them. Whenever Hegel describes sculptures based on his own observations, he deals with contemporary neoclassical works. Accordingly, he illustrates the impression that Greek statues of gods make by way of Greek sculpture, Christian Daniel Rauch's bust of Goethe, whose physiognomy he describes in detail. So from this bust you, in the, uh, for Hegel, you, you can uh, uh, take an, an idea how classical art, classical sculpture functions and works. So for me, it is clear that we cannot expect any novel insights on Greek art from, from Hegel, uh, even though he repeatedly refers to it. Instead, I'm hoping for ideas and insights on a different level. In a morphometic sense, it remains to be seen if Hegel's aesthetics is able to render comprehensible 
on a theoretical level the interplay between arts and intellectual efforts. It will, however, also be important to actually apply Hegel's theories to literature and the visual arts and to examine how they contribute to a more accurate understanding of these works. I'm very grateful that we are able uh, to realize this conference in cooperation with two former Morphomata fellows, Paul Kotman and Michael Squire. They initiated this conference and served as the primary developers uh, of the conference program. So I think I can say it all started uh, one day in, in Cologne. And, and that's, uh, that for me, that, that shows that uh, colleagues like ours is, is important to bring people together to create new ideas uh, in, in this, this, uh, in this uh, context of, of our colleague, of our um, center. I'm also very grateful to the King's College London and to the New School in New York for founding this conference together with Mofomata. So thank you very much. Well, the introductions are nearly over, but um, Paul and I just wanted to give some very brief comments about how we're imagining the next few days and why we were so interested in putting together this conference in the first place. I wanted to begin, though, um, with another note of thanks. Um, a note of thanks, as, as it's been said very often, you've got used to this, um, Hegel's very um, good with triads, and, and this conference is very much a sort of, tri a sort of divisio mixta, a, um, a triadic, um, a trinity of collaborations um, with Cologne and with the New School. Um, and I wanted in particular to acknowledge the help, not just of, of Roderick Beaton, but also of the Arts and Humanities Research Institute here at King's, and in particular to Alex Creighton, standing at the back, who along with Daniel Daly and others at the team, have worked so hard to make what I hope will be a successful conference. Well, the anchor in, for us over the next few days is, of course, Hegel himself, or more particularly, those lectures on aesthetics delivered in the 1820s. Um, of course, there's a large debate about exactly what it is that Hegel said and how we can get at a text of what Hegel said. Um, but fundamental to Hegel was the question of what art is and indeed what art was. What is art as a historical practice? And how does art make known certain ideas? Um, and those questions are, of course, absolutely fundamental to everything that we do, or certainly to everything that I do as, a, as, as someone interested in the history of art. Um, but I think it's also fair to say that Hegel was the ultimate interdisciplinarian before the word was coined. I think Hegel wouldn't have had much truck with the kind of jargon of modern day academia. But I think it is worth emphasizing just how interdisciplinary um, a model Hegel gives us as someone interested in, of course, all the different forms of art, um, but also in their historical appearances. So, of course, in architecture, in sculpture, in painting, but also in music, and also, of course, in poetry in all of its different guises. It's a kind of text or a model that kind of cuts across our own academic and disciplinary boundaries, of course, intersecting at the same time with philosophy and with theology and with all sorts of other disciplines. But I think really kind of gets us all thinking as people interested in the humanities about what it is that we do and why it is that we do it. Of course, for Hegel, that narrative of art that is constructed in the, aesthetics, in the aesthetics is a narrative about what he calls the symbolic, the classical, and the romantic. And I just wanted to, to emphasize there how important um, it is to be doing this conference in collaboration with the Center of Hellenic Studies, because for Hegel, the classical is quite literally pivotal to the whole account of aesthetics. And I think whatever one makes of Hegel's philosophy of art, there can be no denying Hegel's importance for anyone interested in the classical tradition and indeed in the historiography of the classical. Well, over the next few days, our idea has been to bring together um, a motley crew of people from all sorts of different disciplines and with all sorts of different agendas. 
Um, Paul and I can't promise that people will be agreeing with each other. In fact, I think we secretly hope that people won't be agreeing with each other. And very much our idea for the next few days is, is to have a kind of uh, a forum for informal discussion, a forum for discussion that, again, breaks down some of our own academic and disciplinary boundaries. Um, I think it's worth saying finally, and this will just be my last point, that um, neither Paul or I are uh, kind of official Hegel scholars and that our background is an entirely different um, subject. Um, um, Paul is of course a specialist uh, particularly in Shakespeare and I teach here in classics. So, uh, you know, uh, it's, 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 um, the, the intricacies of Hegelian philosophy are a step or two above my pay grade um, in terms of my day job. Um, but I nonetheless think it's worth emphasizing that Hegel helps us to formulate questions in all sorts of interesting ways. And he, again, cuts across those disciplinary boundaries. And I just wanted to end by um, saying something about this, the subtitle, the idea of Hegel um, and the perspectives of art history. Because I think, for me, um, what Hegel really helps us to do is, is think art historically about what it is that we do as art historians. He formulates some of the most pressing questions, I think, of the modern discipline of art history. Questions about what an image is, the ontology of the image. Questions about how one does history from art. That's to say, how one can tell a narrative, tell a story about visual arts. Um, how one can translate them um, in, into, a, um, into a narrative of, of rise and fall, if you like, or a narrative of stylistic history. Um, at the same time, Hegel stands as a very influential model on the history of art, the modern discipline of art history. Um, I think it's fair to say that art historians are deeply Hegelian without always knowing it. Um, and one of the things we want to try and tease out is the way in which Hegel has influenced the historiography of art history in particular. And at a time when interest is turning in particular to world art history, to um, global art history, and to comparative art history, I think there's never been a more pressing time to think about what Hegel can give us, what we want to take from Hegel, or indeed what we want to resist in the Hegelian account. And so for me, that's um, really why, um, as an art historian, Hegel has so much to offer. Even though, of course, for Hegel, um, art isn't just about the fine arts or the visual arts at all. So I think one of the ideas we really wanted to um, play out over the next few days is, is the way in which um, Hegel um, can help us make sense of the modern, disciplinary of, um, modern discipline of art history, but at the same time, how um, the contemporary field of art history can help us illuminate and make sense of, and indeed make use of, the intricacies of Hegelian philosophy. So I hope, however the next three days go, um, it's going to be a forum for debates, for lively debates, and for discussion. Uh, my name is Paul Cotman uh, from the New School in, in New York. Um, I know there are a lot of art historians in the room, and so a, a few of you may be also expert illustrators. Um, I'm not. One of the only places I ever try to illustrate is in the marginalia um, of, of text that I'm reading, where I'll make an exclamation point or a question mark or a happy face next to a point I like or a confused face. Um, and when I want to make myself feel better about um, 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 the thought that I might be growing in my understanding of texts that I read, I'll go back and look at marginalia that I put in texts um, 10 years ago or 15 years ago. And I did this recently with Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit and looked at the marginalia I put in the text the first time I tried to make sense of it. And in paragraph 454, Hegel says, spirit is an artist, der Geist ist Künstler. And I don't remember why exactly, but I circled this a lot and put exclamation points next to it and it struck me as somehow um, a moment of clarity in what was otherwise a desert of opacity uh, the first time I tried to read that text. Um, and in it occurs to me to say that um, um, just as it makes me feel better to look at the revisions in my own marginalia, it makes me feel even better to see that Hegel revised his own understanding of the relationship between art and Geist um, from that 
um, early sentence, which I now understand to express something about his views on what he called Greek art religion, uh, der Kunstreligion, and the way in which um, um, the um, Greeks gave form to their thought in Greek sculpture. Um, and, um, and one of the ways that Hegel revised that in the lectures on fine art, which serve as the touchstone for this conference, was to show how his own philosophical standpoint, as he puts it, seizes in thought and proves itself in the history of fine art, what he calls the fundamental nature of the beautiful in art through all the stages it has gone through in the course of its realization. Um, that sentence struck Michael and, and myself as um, a great touchstone for a conference, um, um, and a conference that would bring together art historians and Hegel scholars um, to move, as Michael said, beyond the strictures and confines of, uh, of disciplines as they're usually constituted. So we very much look forward to the discussion. Um, I just wanted to thank, finally, again, King's College and the administrative staff here for their help, um, Morfamata also for their assistance and funding, um, the New School, my own institution, and especially the speakers for being here. So thank you all. Thanks all for coming. Um, Thank you.